we're here on this field trip today to look at a, a field site of a project called Africa Rising. It's a project looking at the sustainable intensification of mixed farming systems in the Ethiopian highlands. The first phase was very much looking at technology identification and validation on farm. So over four, the four regions of Ethiopia, we had eight participating cabeles, which are like sort of super village scale communities and um, we had around two and a half thousand farmers directly participating in the in the research that we were conducting and that was research across cropping systems livestock systems but also looking at some aspects of crop livestock integration and trade-offs the second phase is still very much a research project but we're trying to refocus to work more closely with our partners in the uh, sort of development organization so that's really um, government uh, extension services, NGOs, even the university sector do a public good uh, promotion of technologies. And with those partnerships active, we're looking well, we have a target for the second phase of around 750,000 uh, households to, uh, to uh, significantly influence. These systems are very traditional. I mean, you can see it, like some of the members of the group are watching some ox plowing going on here. Uh, mainly using local crop varieties. We're at quite a high altitude here. We're around uh, 2,800, 2,900 metres, so um, uh, there's quite a lot of communal grazing land. We're standing on that at the moment. But as you can see, sort of in front of me here, we've got the introduction of, this is uh, Tagasasti, or tree lucerne, which is a multi-purpose tree. This has been grown on these terrace buns so it not only contributes fodder um, but it's also helping to stabilize these buns as a soil and water conservation measure so again crop like livestock integration livestock resources integrated into the landscape a little bit further down you can see on one of the buns there's a kind of tussocky grass that's phalaris now that's mostly been harvested and because we're towards the end of a dry season there's not much regrowth going on there we have there's a lone eucalyptus tree here but there's uh, eucalyptus planted across the landscape now this is something that divides opinion uh quite strongly it, it doesn't uh, the, the the leaves are not palatable as foragers um, but it's quite a nutrient demanding and water demanding crop. However, it's spread like wildfire in Ethiopia since it was introduced in the late 19th century by the emperor, who I think personally brought it back from uh, Australia. And but it, it's a very uh, profitable crop. Uh, the poles are used throughout the country for fencing, for scaffolding, for building. Uh, it's good firewood. So um, it's a very interesting kind of... Uh, Social study, I think, the adoption of eucalyptus here, you know, that farmers are very aware of the, 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 the damage it can potentially do to their landscapes, but the value of it outweighs that. And that's something that we're always working around in sustainable intensification generally. It's these trade-offs between sustainability and productivity, and sometimes even assessing those is a, is a, is a very tall order. So, and then knowing what farmers' priorities are so that we can align our research with what they need is makes for a complex research program <laughs> it's often planted on land that's maybe been overutilized in the past so it's part of a sort of degradation trajectory almost i mean you, you when land is being overutilized and fertility declines then you can't grow the crops that you want to grow so you introduce um you know uh crops or trees that are more tolerant of poor soil conditions and, and you basically end up at the at the bottom of the slope with eucalyptus but it's a profitable profitable tree crop uh, how many people are benefiting from this in this watershed i think we have around 50 households who are actually participating in some aspect of the research so some of them might be participating in um, uh, one particular crop variety trial and others might have a whole range of things from forage production through varieties through improved fertilizer management regimes um, but these have been kind of core research farmers they're the farmers who've uh, implemented the technologies and allowed us to work with them to monitor the progress of those technologies towards uh, sustainable intensification.
Um, as I say, we'll be scaling this into a number of other watersheds, in, both in this area but beyond within the region. But how many livestock are here? And I heard that livestock is primarily kept here in conjunction with the crop. Well, I haven't counted them personally, but um, we most of these households will have some livestock, very few will not have livestock, it's only some of the poorest households, and that would generally involve having a pair of oxen for ploughing, mainly. Um, there might be some one or two dual or dairy cows uh, also in the family. Uh, small ruminants, up here we're high, so we're talking about sheep, and uh, farmers can have anything from two or three sheep to 20 or 30. So, um, and also another important livestock species here that people may be less familiar with is um, the equines, and particularly donkeys. I understand there's 13 million donkeys in Ethiopia, and um, they uh, fulfill a, a you know, very important role as pack animals. So there's, Ethiopia has the highest per capita livestock population in Africa, I believe. And you can check what it is in the FAO statistics. There's synergies and there's, uh, and, and there's conflicts, I mean, in livestock here. I mean, you can see we've planted these, um, these tree lucerne uh, across this, this landscape. But in many areas, land, li uh, livestock are not confined and certainly year-round. So trying to manage this kind of system when there's uh, um, livestock roaming free in this landscape is a, can be a challenge. Um, but of course then there's, well, you can see, you won't, uh, there's very little mechanization, particularly on these kind of slopes here where you, you can see an extremely important function of livestock up, up this slope here. Um, we're heading towards a, um, uh, the main rainy season around here in about a month and a half, two months' time. And land preparation is a, <laughs> is a huge task. Um, I mean, you can see a, a, an arable field being ploughed here, but this will be probably the third or the fourth time this land's been ploughed by an ox team. Uh, and there will probably be one or two more. The, the traditional plough that's used, the Maresha plough, has been around for century or probably millennia um, and it's uh, uh, it's an extremely effective implement but it's not probably the most um, efficient way of ploughing land but it's an, it's an indigenous solution that people are used to it works um, it's not like a tractor if it breaks down um, you fix it with a, another or you build another one you know you get you get another eucalyptus tree and you make another moration plant we do have a focus on small-scale mechanization in the project and in some areas particularly some of the flatter landscapes it certainly does have potential but it's it's tricky uh, there's a high upfront investment um, in terms of the machinery. Uh, you need to have a critical mass of operators because to attract um, you know, entrepreneurs into supporting the machinery through provision of spares, through uh, you know, carrying out repairs, is, you know, there's a kind of hump, that, there's a tipping point you have to get over. So, I mean, and, and certainly on this is approaching one of the steeper landscapes. Operating a mechanised tractor in here is not so straightforward. So I think we're going to be seeing this going on for quite some time now in these areas anyway. In Ethiopia, mostly farmers use, uh, you know, the traditional way of feeding their animals, that is, spreading is a portion of the feed that they have on the ground and let animals eat from the ground. And that practice, you know, that's in a considerable loss of biomass, feed biomass, mm -hmm. almost 30, 40 percent is uh, waste due to trampling, urinating on the feed, and also defecating. So we introduced this feed meter just for two purposes. Firstly, to reduce wastage, and also to allow farmers mix the uh, available feeds they have in a proper way, and feed them so that there's no wastage. And also the labor requirement for feeding is minimized. You know, the women and also youth uh, around the homestead are mainly involved in taking care of animals. So this construction considerably reduces the labor load on women mainly.
So uh, that has really uh, produced uh, good results, and now we are trying to scale this technology to more farmers and also more areas. So in the different uh, Africa rising sites. I think if, have, if you have questions, we can, you can ask. And can, I, can I just add one general comment? This, yeah. this question of waste in relation to intensification. So, okay, most of the intensification technologies we look at are, are aimed at producing more. So imagine we produce 80% more feed to feed to livestock, and then we waste 40% of what we feed. It's all gone. All yeah. of the extra we produce is gone. So we often don't think of... Waste reduction. I'm looking at you, Jesse, because this is an issue for you guys as well. And you work, I know, or you have links with the post harvest innovation laboratory. This idea of producing more to waste more is just, um, you know, I'm maybe I was brought mm. up in a time of hardship, but it seems just completely wrong to me. So I think combining technologies that increase production with technologies that reduce waste, talking in the most general terms, this is just an example, is, is a really big thing that we need to look at in terms of intensification. This is, by the way, it's a simple um, uh, technology. Yeah. Uh, farmers uh, have their own this eucalyptus tree and they want to at this house and in this feeding trough. And then the only thing they need is just nails. And so if they have, they can use Colgate Iron Sheet or grass mat or whatever they have, you know. <laughs>